The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to modify a Nintendo Entertainment System with a slot loading cartridge mechanism. This will make it more modern and hopefully reduce those gray blinking screen errors. Let's start off with some history of the Nintendo console itself. But first, the news. Today in bad news, I'd like to show you the new pinball controller board I made. It's similar to the old one, but it's different, obviously. Smaller this way, but a little longer this way. It has some new features. 64 switches, 64 lights, accessory port for motors, knocker, 24 solenoids, but I can also do a DMD and an alphanumeric display like on the older pinball machines. So yeah, uh, this is made for my own games, other people's games, and possibly something that people can buy and use in their own homebrew games in the future. The new Ben Heck Pinball System. It doesn't have a name. Just new Ben Heck Pinball System. The Nintendo Entertainment System first came out in Japan in 1983. It was called the Famicom for Family Computer. Nintendo then brought the system to America. But by that time, the video game crash of 1984 had occurred. So Nintendo wanted to differentiate their console from the current consoles, which the Famicom looked like. So what they did was they re-engineered it with a front-loading cartridge slot so it would resemble more of a VCR than a game console. But the larger cartridge in the slot is mostly for show. The cartridges themselves are mostly empty. The front-loading slot used an elaborate and most likely expensive connector called a ZIF, Zero Insertion Force System. This should not be confused with an actual ZIF socket, the kind used for flat ribbon cables nowadays. Nintendo's slot had a couple problems. One, inserting the cartridge actually required more than zero force, so that's false advertising right there. Two, when you press the cartridge down, it bent the lower pins more than the top ones, eventually wearing them out. And three, Nintendo's famous lockout chip required a better connection than the game circuitry itself, often causing all of those gray screen and cartridge blowing problems. Here's how I'd like my system to work. You insert the game by hand, and it trips a pair of IR sensors which tells the console that a game has been inserted. At that time, there are two friction wheels on either side of the cartridge that pull the cartridge into the console, so you don't need to be pushing it anymore, toward the connector. Here's an extreme close-up of the connector. We have the PCB here, card edge connector inside of the cartridge. We have a pair of jaws with um, Molex pins on them. What the jaws will do is they'll clamp down on the cartridge once the cartridge hits a limit switch telling the system that it's inserted all the way. So instead of pushing the cartridge into some jaws like that, we're going to clamp the jaws onto the cartridge like that. But will it work? I don't know. Let's take apart this Nintendo. <gasps> it came with a free copy of Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. Score. The expansion port they never used. <sighs> Cartridge connector is kind of a expensive thing to put on a system if you're never going to use it. But those were different times. Hmm, power supply is AC. Interesting. I miss the good old days of video game consoles with quite obvious screws that were Phillips screws and you just unscrew them all and the console comes apart. Uh, let's see, it's RF shielding of course. Here's the ZIF cartridge slot. Goes in at an angle and then it clicks down. It's well built, but you know, it's fundamentally flawed because this part, if you look at it, it doesn't move. The cartridge goes into it 
and bends down around it, which means, as you mentioned earlier, one side of the pins gets um, distorted a lot faster than the other. So I'm gonna pull this out. Now the newer Nintendo, the uh, top loading one, it just has a regular, you know, cartridge slot, so it works better. But then it omits the nice composite audio video out, so just can't win them all. Here's the underside of the Nintendo circuit. We have the expansion port, which was never used, uh, CPU, picture processing unit, buffer, RAM, lockout chip, a NOT gate, and I'm not sure what those two do. But yeah, there's not much to it. Oh, here's the pull-ups for the controller. Controllers use shift registers. They're actually pretty easy. And here's, we'll be able to remove this whole box here. Although maybe we could leave it. Look at this thing. Look at that. That had to be kind of expensive. Was it really worth it? First I thought about making a new case, but I think there might be enough room in this case to do it, which would be cool. See, here's all you really need. And it's already below the surface of the case a little bit. Then we put the lid on, the lid is completely empty. Put the lid on, take our cartridge, we stick it in. We see it needs to go this far, that's how far it normally went, but we've got this much more space behind it, which means hopefully we should have room back here for our mechanism. I'm heating up the stalk on this desoldering iron. Sometimes the solder will get stuck in the uh, air passage. So I'm actually using a blowtorch to heat it up and then dump out the solder, which all goes on the floor in a big sploosh. See, now its air passages are clear without a prescription. Trying to shrink your own computer to the size of a Raspberry Pi? Not easy. Accessing Raspberry Pi tips, tools, accessories, discussions, and more on the Element 14 community? Much easier. Discover all the ways we're building an easier experience at element14.com forward slash evolution. While I'm in here, I'm gonna do some mods on the Nintendo. I'm going to disable the lockout chip, then also add stereo sound. To disable the lockout chip, lift up pin four. It's normally connected to five volts. Now we're gonna connect it to ground. That will disable the lockout chip and severely reduce the number of gray screens you get. We're gonna attach pin four to a wire, and then we'll attach that wire to ground, which will be pretty much any area on the edge of the board. Oh, I should probably do one that's not near a screw hole though. Oh wait, there's a pad right there, I can use that. Sometimes it takes a little bit more oomph on these old boards because you know, they were soldered 25 years ago. Nintendo has sound on its CPU, just like the Nintendo 64. These first two pins are where the sound comes from. Nintendo has five sound channels. Two of them are on the left pin and three of them are on the right pin. So if you grab the sound right off the chip before it gets mixed elsewhere, you can get a stereo separation. 
Ah, I gotta pull the skin off this snake. Now I can eat it for breakfast. It's gonna be really delicious. No, this is actually an Xbox 360 video cable. And they're kind of useless now, but I keep them around because you can get nice shielded cables out of it, which I can use on things like this Nintendo. For your own good, Nintendo. <sighs> we can add a pair of uh, RCA jacks back here for left and right audio. Video, we can keep the same. I'm going to add the left and right audio jacks. They'll come out here on the side. And I'll also have these potentiometers because most of the tutorials online suggest I'm um, mixing in a little bit of the mono sound so it uh, isn't completely separated. So I'll put these potentiometers on the side so I can do that manually after the fact. <laughs> and then we're going to attach a wire to this resistor here, which will give us mono audio, which we can mix into both channels just to give it a little bit of, just to fill it out a little bit. So these wires are the ones going to our audio mixing. Now I'm going to wire up the 72 pin connector manually. Here's my idea. We use these Molex connectors and these use what's called a cantilever where they kind of compress. See that? And my thought is we line up a bunch of these in a row and then we make a sandwich where it comes over the contacts and then it sandwiches down. So instead of pushing the contact into it, it pushes down onto the, onto the contacts and the card edge connector. So I've got to hook up, I don't have to hook up all 72 of these uh, because the Nintendo, you can't really see it, maybe you can. The center connections don't go into anything. Those were going to go to the expansion port originally. Uh, like on the cartridge connector, that's where they lead us to the expansion port. But since the Nintendo never used the expansion port, the cartridge's connections to the expansion port are not used. So that will help. And just to double check, I have the Japanese to American pinout of the Nintendo connector right here. The Japanese version didn't have the expansion port. So you can see the Japanese one had the pins here, where the American one here has all the same pins, but an expansion port in the middle. That's where the Japanese one has no connection in the center. So those are the pins we can emit. Using some perf board and a lot of Molex connector contacts, I have made this new cartridge slot connector. The idea is this will bite down on the cartridge instead of the cartridge sliding into it. So before, you'd have this in the Nintendo. It crunches into place. Now what we'll do is these will be open inside the Nintendo like this. The cartridge will be fed in with a roller. And then when it hits an end stop, we'll know that it's in position. And then we'll make a mechanism that squeezes these tight. Conversely, when you go to release it, these will open up, allowing it to come out. So there will be no force when this enters. Basically the force will be applied by the teeth, not by this being pushed into the teeth. So we'll get a mechanism hooked up to this and in the next episode, we'll hopefully mechanically get this all working.
My rave today is about the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's truly one of the most classic consoles there ever was, and it also single-handedly revived the video game industry. While its CPU was nearly identical to the older Atari systems, it had much improved graphics thanks to a separate processor and character RAM. Developers could also put hardware in the cartridges, allowing for larger and more advanced games, something you can't do nowadays with a disc. I do have some rants about the Nintendo, though. The Square controllers, while innovative, dented your fingers during play sessions. And the lockout chip was a pain in the butt. For the cartridges, you can even say it blew. <laughs> and since then, their consoles have all had weird limitations, like the Super Nintendo Speed, the N64's texture buffer, or the GameCube's mini discs. But still, a very important part of gaming history. Today's viewer question is from TrueTom96, who asks, For many projects where you need to make an enclosure with the CNC machine, you use a material that looks like a kind of foam. It's usually black or white. What is this exactly? That material is called Comatex, and another brand name is Sintra. There's also a marine version called Starboard. It is a very high-density PVC foam that is strong, yet easy to cut. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll work on the loading mechanism and the cartridge contact clamper for the Nintendo unit. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.